Hello and welcome to The Conversation with me, Amanda Decadene. This series of The Conversation is brought to you by VS Voices, another fantastic podcast I host, which highlights trailblazing women from around the world to celebrate the multifaceted nature of the female experience. You can listen to Voices on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. On this week's episode, I'm speaking to author Jeff Brown. Amanda? Hello, Jeff. A pleasure to connect. You too. Welcome to the conversation. It really is nice to see your face and I'm excited to talk to you. I stumbled across your work somehow and God damn, it just speaks to me so much. Wonderful. So let me ask you a question. What stage of your life did you start writing books and sharing the insights that you've shared with us. I started writing just before 9-11. I knew that I would write. It felt like an encoded path for me. I knew there were three things that I was going to do. It was the third of them. I tried a number of times before that, but it wasn't, it just wasn't the right time yet. And then I went to Harbin Hot Springs in Northern California and had a really intense two-week emotional clearing stage. And I had a profound love experience that I wrote about eventually in a book called An Uncommon Bond, and I needed to work my way through that material, and Harbin was the place to do that. And at the end of that two-week period, I felt so clear and so present and just ready to start writing things. And I came home, and I started to write the next day, and I haven't stopped since. And what were you doing before you were writing? I had become a lawyer. I articled in criminal law with a prominent guy named Greenspan in Toronto in the early 90s. And then and all the way through, I had a small home improvements business. And then after I left law, I continued to own this small business and continued to work most of the time during the day. And I would write from 9 30 at night until 3 or 3 30 in the morning, unstoppably on my wall and on hands and on my computer program. And the calling just took root and it just wouldn't stop. And now I'm not doing that business anymore. I'm just doing things related to the work that I'm bringing to the world. But yeah, I like to say that I've knocked on more doors in North America than any single human being on the road to reaching the stage where I was ready to write these words down. Fascinating. What do you think it was about writing that you weren't able to do it before the time was right? I'm asking that because when you read your work, you're like, there's no fucking way this guy would be a lawyer. It, criminal law as well. It's so different. So that's such a departure. Was that kind of two different lives you were living or how did you do that? I mean, I articled and then was called to the bar and left and then briefly went back just to confirm that the decision was the right one. It was the most difficult decision I've ever made. I absolutely loved criminal trial law and so many things I wanted to do in the law that were really important to me. But there was this little voice, the little voice that knows inside that was pressing me in another direction. I, I think I wanted to make us more aware in a courtroom of the relationship between emotional health, mental health issues, and misbehavior. I wanted to challenge the status quo as some kind of a sacred activist in terms of the medical jurisprudence area, mainstream medicine, things that I'm still writing about and thinking about. I just felt at the end of it as though I was capable of anything and that there was something else I could do that could ultimately affect more people. But I needed to learn more. I needed to suffer more. I needed to develop more before I could bring this kind of a message into the world. Yeah. So the, after you went to Harbin Hot Springs and you said you did some deeply personal work and reflective work, what shape did that take for you? I raced through the forest. There's, I don't know, hundreds of acres there in this clothing optional retreat center. I smashed the ground intensely to move the rage and anger that I had yet to resolve from the relationship experience that I'd had. I got Watsu on almost daily basis, which is like water shiatsu to continue to open me. So I continued to go to my opening edge. And every time I went to an opening edge, I would encounter another wave of unresolved material held in the armored body that needed to be cleared in the Watsu. Cleared we in the do. Clear, if we do, as we do. Cleared in the forest, cleared on the dance floor. I was just wildly frenzied in a release stage there. And I remember at the very end of it, sitting at the top of Harbin Mountain, looking out over the value, just feeling like, okay. I felt like I could see my life clearly. I cleared enough emotional debris that I wasn't all bunked up with old material. 
I felt deeply present through the body itself. And then I had clarity and I heard myself say, it's time to write. Now you have something to mm. write. And you listen to that voice. I listen to the little voice that knows. I'd always l really listen to it, ultimately leaned in its direction. But this felt like a certainty. And, you know, that you test whether it's a certainty. You authenticate it through lived experience. So I went to High Park. That's, your, that's your analytical mind combining yeah, with your sure. emotional. That's great. Important, important to acknowledge that yeah. listening to the little voice inside is crucial. That's our guiding star. But then also we have to apply our intellect to it and go, okay, is this just insane? Or what's yeah. the practicality on this? Yeah, I call them depth charges. So you have a, a, you think you have a calling. So you go and explore whether or not that calling is true. You authentic it with lived experience. I had gathered together bags of notes that I'd written with the intention of writing years before into a hotel room in Montreal, sat down and said, I'm going to write my great book. And it, the reality was I wasn't ready to write my great book. You have to be self-honest enough and sharp enough to notice and to make distinctions between a calling that's real, but isn't yet ready to be actualized and a calling that is ready to be actualized. I said in soul mm. shaping, if you step on the right path at the wrong time, you've stepped on the wrong path. So mm. trying to write before I was ready to write was the wrong path. Were you afraid to put law down and fully commit to writing? Absolutely. I came from a Jewish family. I was a firstborn, impoverished family. I felt like I could egoically find great gratification, find great financial gratification, help the people around me. It was the most difficult and terrifying thing, particularly because my father, who had great abilities, was somewhat immobilized for most of his life. So I was afraid when I lay down on the couch to just feel into these questions that I was going to move in the same direction my father had gone. So I had a lot of reasons to stay in law, never leave law, die in a courtroom doing law. But this little voice that knows that I called Little Missy, I had a name for this part of me. Little say, Missy. Little Missy. A Little Missy interfaced with this warrior consciousness, which was my primary adaptation for a long time. And the challenge was Little Missy wasn't really clear as to what I would do or when I would do it. So I was making some kind of leap of fate in the direction of a destiny that I couldn't be absolutely certain of. But I knew, I just somehow knew that spending my life being even a great trial lawyer and doing wonderful and noble work wasn't exactly what this incarnation was about for me. How old were you at that time when you decided to quit law and fully commit to the work you're doing now? I had taken time off during my law school phase to do therapy and to do yoga and become more acquainted with my material. I think I was 29 when I decided after the bar admission course to just not sign on the dotted line. A group of us were in an office in downtown Toronto and get to it. And I, just some part of me just said, you just wait. And how was that for you to see your first book completed and go, okay, here it is. So I wrote Soul Shaping, and then I submitted it to, it was called Namaste Publishing, Barry Online. And they made an offer. They were Eckhart Tolle's original publisher at Power Now. And I went through a whole process of, they cut the book in half, and I was like, you can't cut my soul's journey in half. So I, re Welcome I rejected it. Welcome to Pride Wishing. <laughs> absolutely. So I rejected the offer, and then self-published the first version of it. And I would literally drive around in the car with this little blue copy of Soul Shaping beside me and just felt so deeply gratified, um, mm. deeply gratified. Yeah. The whole thing is just gratifying. I, I, nobody handed anything to me. I earned every step of it. And there is a deep satisfaction in knowing I don't have the uncertainty anymore as to which direction to go in my life. I had that confusion, little Missy warrior bull leading me in different directions, but I had the blessed 20 years of not ever feeling as though I've gone in the wrong direction, which is just a wonderful feeling. So how many books have you written now? Seven. That's Seven. a lot. That is yeah. a lot. Little Missy is busy. <laughs> Little Missy, absolutely. Little Missy is busy. Absolutely. Uh, she's not, she's just not quite done with me yet. It seems. It seems. And so does each book reflect what you are working on in your life at that time? Yeah, to an extent. Like I look back at my first quotes book and I don't resonate 
with some of those quotes. But the longer three books felt encoded. I really believe in encoded paths. I believe in what James Hillman called the image. I believe some of us or all of us come in with some, what I call sacred purpose, some kind of true path that's encoded in us. And our intuition tries to lead us in that direction, our own version of Little Missy. And oftentimes we lose our way and we experience what I call truth aches that are indicators that we're off path. So I knew I'd write soul shaping. I knew I'd write an uncommon bond. And I believed that I would write grounded spirituality as my three longer books. So part of it is encoded and part of it reflects my growing edge at the same time. I want to talk about articulations because I love that book so much. I have it with my morning readings. And if you'll notice, I share a lot of your work online because I read it most days. One of the reasons is that it condenses feelings into a very easily accessible language. So many books you pick up, you have to have a certain level of awareness or consciousness or understanding in order just to like understand what the person is saying. And I feel like you've got a way of translating multi-layered concepts in very simple terms that just give you the information. So I really appreciate that. I mean, it's important to me to be accessible. It's important to me for people to feel like they're met where they are rather than feeling perpetually shamed and diminished and feeling as though they're not awakened enough to rock a concept. And I have no interest in that. I still love humanity, despite all the reasons not to. And it's important for me that my work is accessible to people. Yeah, it is very much. You know, social media has made consciousness and self-improvement and well-being accessible to everybody. And I love that because I do think that these tools should be available to anybody who wants them, regardless of yep. where you live or what you're, whether you can afford to take a course or not. So I love that it has democratized well-being. But then there is this other side that is the sort of toxic well-being and toxic self-obsession and the kind of narcissism aspect of self-improvement that I find really challenging. So how do you navigate that yourself? I just try to stay inside of my own process. I've turned down many things because, you know, I gave up a lot to be able to find this voice, to sustain and deepen this voice, to live inside of this voice. And it's important for me to protect it. It's very important mm. to protect your calling. Your calling becomes a buffer against the madness of the world, but you also have to assert yourself to protect it. When you're inside of a genuine calling, you don't present yourself like that. So I think there's a meaningful distinction. I've been in this industry, this soul celebrity industry for a long time now. Wait, what do you call it? The soul the celebrity movement. Um, S -O. Celebrity. Yeah, they're pre all pretending they're spiritually advanced celebrities. It's a celebrity movement that- Oh my God, I love that. Did you that did you coin that, that phrase, soul celebrity? That's exactly I, yes. it. I have a whole dictionary on my, my main website, jeffbrown.co terminology, but, wow. but because that's what it is and it's artificial, it's constructed. I get people have to make a living. I mean, I, I totally understand that, but you know, it is presenting a version of awakening that in my experience with many people in this field is not congruent with the reality of their lives. And I think it's probably exhausting for them to have to hold up that presentation. And it's it's important for me to try to just remain true to pass. Otherwise, little Missy kicks up trouble. Luckily, I haven't heard from her that much for the last few decades because I've been on path. It's when I right. start straying a little, temptations, we all have those. Then she appears to just remind me to go back in the direction that I'm supposed to be walking. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's beautiful. Little Missy. Gosh, we, and we've all got a little Missy. It's just a question of we do listen to her or not. And it's good to name your little Missy. It's good to yeah. give a name to your little Missy. Make yeah. friends with, familiarize yourself with, understand who they may be. Absolutely. And don't just call it intuition. Understand, at least in my view, that this is something connected to your true path in this lifetime. It, it's not a little game it's playing. It's trying to pull you in the direction of what's gratifying, what's self-actualizing, what reflects your truest path and purpose in this lifetime. And if we were all walking our truest path in this lifetime, nobody would be harming anybody because we'd just be so bloody gratified at every moment and so desirous of bringing that offering to the world that we wouldn't see so much of the craziness that we now see. 
It's so interesting because I know what you're speaking about. And I'm in an industry that historically the entertainment industry is really lacking in a moral compass and integrity and authenticity. That's not to say that within the entertainment industry, there are not people who are, you know, really fulfilling their calling in life and creating, telling profound stories. And that those people, of course, exist. But overall, I would say it is an industry that people are looking for power, prestige and fame, that kind of stuff. And I do find it quite difficult to operate. I feel like I'm operating with a deck of cards that everyone else isn't really playing with, you know? And so, you know, how do you maintain your integrity and your authenticity when you do believe that you're, you're in the right place for what it is that you need to do? And that's a question that I think a lot of people who listen to the work that I do or watch the work that I do look to me for because I am someone who has done my very best to also listen to my version of Little Missy and to honor what that truth is and to shine a light on subject matter and content and narratives that are really important, or at least I think they're really important and need to be centered in a way that is helpful to people. But I want to ask you, how do you encourage people to honor their calling and honor their truest self when they are living in the world, which let's face it, does not operate under those criteria. Well, I mean, I do a lot of session work with people who have that exact question. How do I find, excavate my calling? Because so many people don't even know that a calling lives within them in a distracted, overwhelmed, survivalistic, manipulative culture. There are many powers that be that benefit from our shrunkenness, from our uncenteredness, from our disconnect from path and purpose. The last thing many of these systems want is for people to be emblazoned with purpose because they will no longer that be That will tempted. mess up the ecosystem. It, it'll mess up the, all the systems. E- economic <laughs> ecosystem. Yeah. Ab- yeah. No, you're absolutely right. First of all, I encourage them to ground things in reality. So that the important thing is to figure out a way to take care of the bottom line so they're not worried about economic reality all the time. And then once they've done that, to find a way to create space to explore, to excavate, actualize, humanifest, whatever that calling is that lives inside of them. And because my experience is if you don't take care of the economic realm, that you're not going to be able to sustain your inquiry into your calling. So you have to be able to take care of that. And many people on the planet are in a survivalist energy. They can't even begin to think about authentic paths when they're on the survivalistic side of the bridge. And you adverted to earlier the desire to have everybody to have access to these concepts, to healing, unresolved trauma, to finding true path in the heart of this landscape. And I think that's my work in my own little way. And I think that's what we need to do in the world. I mean, that's true democracy when everybody has access to the excavation and the manifestation of their gifts and their callings. And, uh, and we have to make that practical and accessible and make conversations like this available to everybody when you're doing. That. Yeah. I want to take that a step further and say, once somebody has identified what their calling is and they are on that path. They still have to navigate on a daily basis, sometimes on a minute by minute basis, the fact that there are times when the universe is ushering you forward and you're like, yes, this is a smooth path. And then it is often not. And that does not mean that you are not where you are supposed to be. That is part of the journey. But holding on to your knowledge that you are on the right path when it gets so incredibly difficult and nothing is going your way. And it feels like maybe this this is telling me that I'm not on the right path. What do you tell people then? To be absolutely persistent and at the same time, remarkably patient. I think the sociology of what we exist within is an important thing we're a part of, which is that very few people in this world ever get to go through these stages, interface with a little Missy, hear from a little Missy, figure out a way to survive in this world economically, and then find their way to their path. It's a gnarly, it is often, and certainly has been for me, nothing but gnarly. Because you're trying to hold up a survivalist consciousness, which is where most of the world's vibrating, and then start asking the question, who am I really? What's encoded in me? What's the unresolved trauma in the way of my accessing my path? And My belief at this stage of human development, I don't want people walking around feeling like failures because they can't find that calling and live that calling. They aren't failures. If they can even step a little across the bridge to authenticity in this world, 
They are pioneers of their ancestry and their lineage. It is remarkable that we're even entertaining this inquiry in many ways. My grandmother used to say, you're doing all the things that I couldn't do, Jeffrey. You're doing mm-hmm. all the things that I couldn't yeah. do. Yeah. So I think that's important. And I think it's also important, I believe, at this stage of human development to understand that clearing emotional debris, healing unresolved trauma is our sacred purpose at this stage of human development for most of us. People will go, how long do I have to do this for before I find my calling? And I said, this, maybe this is your calling for this lifetime. The fact that you're even willing to pull those skeletons out of the closet to look at them, to feel them, and to try to heal them is a remarkable act of sacred purpose and a great calling and offering. It absolutely is. And as you said, that amounts the reality for people who are working multiple jobs, who are dealing with gender and race oppression, people who come from trauma, violence, who are raising kids, who are dealing with whatever it is. Like all of those things, it is a miracle to me that any of us are able to get out from underneath all of that yep, enough to get off our knees because Absolutely. it's a miracle. It is a miracle. We are so fucked with systemically, let's face it. And, yes, we are. And if you're trying to work your way through the forest to find your way to your truest path in a culture that economically, politically, spiritually, and religiously benefits from your shrunken, it is a overwhelmingly challenging thing to do. And at the same time, what else are we here to do? Right. And it is really baby steps. I started my journey when I was 15 years old and I was, I did almost a year in juvie. And that was where I really started my journey because that was the first time that I realized that I had a problem with alcohol and drugs. I was exposed to therapy, although I did not embrace it at all. And then I got sober when I was 19, when I was pregnant with my first child and got into recovery. So I, thank God, been in recovery for most of my adult life at this point, which had been the bedrock and the foundation for all of my growth, to be honest. Without that, as the bare, the bare bones, the skeleton, my, my sobriety and my recovery is the skeleton, I look at it. And everything else, what I have learned and added along the way. But I am so grateful that I started this path at such a young age and that I've been able to grow up in recovery and known from such a young age that this work is crucial to my existence. And I think so many people do have the feeling that their own self-reflective work and the work we're talking about is crucial to their well-being. And yet, the path is so cluttered, not only systemically, but just their day-to-day life, you know, are so overwhelming. It is so hard for people yep. to even make the smallest move. And that's why it is baby step. It is tiny little incremental movement. For much of my recovery, it's been very small movements. And then I've had these cataclysmic periods of time where for an entire year, I'm just fucked. I'm just like in it. And you're like, oh my God, I'm never... How am I ever going to come out of this? And then one day you realize, oh, I'm not in that place. And oh my God, I have grown a new perspective, a new version of me is here. And I didn't even notice it happening. I think it's also important to think about how much material we're carrying from our ancestry. You know, I mean, independent of the challenges of daily life, which can just be enough to block this inquiry altogether. We may generational be trauma. One of the first generations to ever even begin to contemplate acknowledging we're trauma survivors. And but the fact that the pandemic happened and now everyone's talking about trauma. And I there's some insincere elements to that, but there's very sincere parts to that. People were forced inside of a room, no more distractions, nowhere to go. And they had to that face the themselves. fact that they're carrying all kinds of stuff that's not just theirs. And I think it's important to really recognize we are pioneering consciousness just in the fact that we're recognizing that we're holding all this material that emanates from our ancestry and not just from our individual life experience. It's an enormity, really. It is. It's an absolute enormity. And that's why it is really important. I love what you're doing. I love what you're saying about making it incremental and realistic so that people don't feel like failures if they can't arrive at some place they feel called to in a 15 minute time period. 100%. Because that just doesn't work like that. And let's talk about that the misconception that there is any arrival place. Yeah. Uh, so, 
lately I have been looking at the fact that because I did start recovery at such a young age, there's a part of me that feels like, wow, the amount of work I need to do on a daily basis still in order to not rage on people, to have compassion for people and myself, to show up and do my commitment to do it with as much grace and dignity as I can. There is a feeling sometimes of like, when is this ever going to be not my primary purpose? When do I actually get to experience life with more ease, given how long I've been doing this? Do you ever feel like, oh, I cleared enough or like I've worked through so much stuff that I can rest here for a while? Or is there always a sort of undercurrent of there's more to do, there's more to do? I had this period of time where I find it so gratifying to live as a creative. Mm -hmm. And it is like a buffer against not only the madness of the world, but my own madness in many ways. So I think finding a calling that is inherently gratifying to some extent, independent of all this persistent emotional process work is helpful. Gives you something to look forward to, something that feels like a protectorate, something that's inherently gratifying. So for me, I just want to experience presence as a whole being experienced not as a perfecting a singular thread of meditative consciousness while the rest of my life is a complete shit show. That doesn't appeal to me. So, you know, for me, it's about finding the growth process invigorating, energizing, exciting, satisfying, but at the same time, and hoping to reach a stage where you feel peace with path. And that's why I come back to sacred purpose or encoded image or innate image. Because I think if you find that, it's not necessarily easy. My path isn't easy. It's I work like a dog. Um, probably work harder than most dogs. But at the same time, I think knowing that you're where you are supposed to be and on the path you're supposed to walk gives you a coach you in a way with a sort of gratification that makes it easier to continue to move forward, even though you're never going to re- reach a stage in this world at this stage where you feel perfected or mastered or awakened or realized as an end. I just don't believe it exists. I think it's delusional. I think the whole spiritual world is predicated on that and premised on that delusion. And I think what we want to do is work towards deeper and truer degrees of gratification on our life's Mm -hmm. journey. If you love the conversation, then I wanted to tell you about another podcast I host called VS Voices. The VS Voices podcast provides a platform for women to speak their diverse truths, share personal stories, and advance discussions of issues that are important to them. You can listen to Voices on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. So what a year. Okay. Do you have concepts that you think, okay, this is what I want to send to this work around? Because I know I have that. Like with my series with About the Men, there is concepts that I've been exploring for years that I then center in those interviews. And I build in to those interviews, discussions about those themes, because those are the themes that I think should have attention put on them. And so I invite people into the discussion about those themes, whether they like it or not. They don't have to answer it. But I ask questions around specific issues that I think are important to highlight. Do you have that with your work where you think, okay, I, there's certain concepts and themes that are really resonating with me and I'm going to focus this next body of work on those concepts? Is that how you structure it or is it just a free form? Well, I think for the longest time it felt encoded. It felt like, okay, you're going to write about love and higher consciousness. And I wrote a love story about that. And then I knew it was really all about, I made a film called Carmageddon with this wild spiritual teacher named Bhagavan Das with Ram Das, Sean Korn, you know, and, I was really at the beginning of this grounded spirituality inquiry. What is this thing? I was a psychotherapy guy. I worked with Alexander Lowen, a co-founder of Bioenergetic. I wasn't into spirituality. And then I was like, right. what are they talking about? Because I found this thing they called awakening through the emotional release process in my somatic psychotherapy process. And then I reached the end of that and it was like, okay, you know, I've said everything, mostly everything I have to say about that. And now I think my primary focus has shifted for various experiential reasons in the direction of focusing on abuse of power, not just the more obvious versions, the bullies of the world, but also the invisible bullies of the world. And because I believe that everything that's imprisoning humanity is on one level or another economically, spiritually, religiously, and certainly politically about abuse of power. So my themes have shifted back in the direction of who I was in my law years, ironically. And I think that's my 
going to be my point to focus for the next number of years. So what are the invisible learners? Well, they're the ones who use their minions to do their bidding rather than doing it in the more obvious ways. And I think it's very important to talk about them because it's more subtle. They do things that are more what we might call echoic, echoes of their presence in order to affect certain outcomes and ends, but not in the most obvious ways. Because now that we've entered the era of the whistleblower, pretty much, which I think is happening. The first stage is calling out the bullies, the very obvious bullies. But all they're going to do then is go underground. That's all they ever do. And use minions in various disconnected forms to affect their goals. So I think the next stage is for us to start talking about and calling out the invisibilities. Because nothing will change if we don't get down to the bottom line with respect to abuse of power and all the various ways that it's manifested in our world. Yeah, I mean, I support people being held accountable for their abuse of power. I support people being held accountable for unacceptable behavior, but I don't support the way in which so much of that is done. And I don't support the fact that there's a mob mentality around when somebody decides that someone has done something wrong without a real um, discussion that presents multiple sides and is balanced. And that is very difficult to find today. I'm, I'm totally with you. I mean, in most cases, I'm horrified by cancel culture, but I also step back and ask myself, where, what is this divide and conquer game? What's happening algorithmically? What's happening systemically that we're being manipulated to hate the person who doesn't agree with our position? And how are we per- complicit? How are we perpetuating that? But who's benefiting from this? I don't hate the left. I don't hate the right. I don't hate the center. I think. Yeah, I feel the same way. All of them have something to offer. Absolutely. But my real question is who is benefiting from this positioning? What is your analysis of that? I believe that there are various economic and political. Let me just say, I think very few people move into the highest level of the political world because they're motivated by the desire to do service. I think that most people who enter into that fray are either unhealthily, egoically motivated or economically motivated. So yeah. most people, there are the exceptions, but most people who have become extremely famous have got a lot of untreated wounds. And I'm startled by it because we're conditioned to project onto celebrity that they have something special that we don't have. This is what happens. And so often it is people who are overcompensating from a very unhealthy childhood, who have a horrible self-concept and who are energized and desperate enough to do everything they can to finally gain public acclaim. Unfortunately, in the political and economic realms, those people end up having power and they misuse their power. And it absolutely benefits them if we keep looking to the person on the right or on the left as the enemy. So we don't notice that this person who we've projected onto is actually benefiting more than anybody else is from our disdain for each other. So yeah. who do you think is benefiting? Because here's the thing. I try to fuck with the algorithm by following people who are outside of my echo chamber outside Amazing. of the bubble. And I'm just curious to hear what other people are talking about. And people even send me messages like, I'm horrified to see that you're following this type of social me media. And I'm saying, oh, fuck off is what I think. Give me a break. I want to hear what people are saying. I'm uh, curious. We grew up We grew up like that, wanting to, I yeah, mean, everybody I'm had an right. opinion. I'm proud that people get on with it and do what they yeah. want to do. And that's the next school of thought that I come from. But I'm trying to fuck with the algorithm because by following people who speak about concepts that maybe I'm offended by even, or I don't care about, or it's whatever it is, to see if that changes what I'm being fed on a daily basis. Because I do believe it's like, it's like anything that you put your attention on is going to grow. That's just the way it is for me. If I'm reading something every single day, it's going to grow. That's it. And I've even been interviewing people who I might have very differing opinions to at times. And there's a whole bunch of people who want to follow me who are offended that I'm giving somebody a platform when really I'm just saying, this is how ideas are formed. This is how, for me, my identity was formed. It was by looking at all the different options or as many that I was exposed to and going, that resonates with me. Wow, I feel really good when I talk to that person or I hear that person or I read that thing or 
God, I feel really anxious when I hear that person talk or I read something that they've written or I'm around that person. It's reverse psychology that I've been able to work out who I am. And without any of those options, we're almost churning out a kind of fulfillment of a person. All people must think like this or like this. And we're breathing out of people individualism. And that is worrying to me because it is the people, the woman who created penicillin, the man who created the telephone, like all these people had individualized thoughts. They were individual. They were thinking differently about things. They saw things differently. And we've had some of the greatest minds and some of the most maniacal, heinous minds, but also some of the greatest minds that have come from thinking outside the box. And I feel very worried about the boxes that everyone is being required to squash themselves into because I feel like we're going to be churning out homogenized people. Absolutely. I mean, I, if I think sometimes if I had grown up now, I would never have felt comfortable crafting new language. I would never have let myself go loose writing on walls, waking up at three in the morning, letting language come through me. I would have been more self-conscious. I grew up at a time like you did, where I felt like it was okay to explore all these pathways of possibility to decide which one resonated with me that isn't happening now. We have to think about confirmation bias and how that works and how optics are inducing a kind of confirmation bias. But I think we have to come back to a question I never had to ask when I was younger, which is who is benefiting yeah. from this so who movement is away? Who you've from, raised this a couple of times. I'm curious what you think. I think that there are various political agendas not in the center that are extremer on the left side or extremer on the right side that I think benefit from being able to craft the world that they're wanting to craft. We culturally bounce back and forth between the extreme left governments and the extreme right, those people who identify with that benefit and everybody in the center gets lost. And I'm concerned now because of this algorithmic piece and whatever else is impacting on us, that we're now being set up on one level or another to move in the direction of one of these two extremes. And I don't identify with those two extremes. I don't either. I love individuation. I believe in the soul's journey. I believe in, I can't remember who used the term, the polyphrenic soul. It might've been Gene Houston, but the multi-aspect itself, you can't begin to find that multi-aspect itself, develop all those pathways and parts inside of yourself if you're being forced to be either the one on the extreme left or the one on the extreme right. Ultimately, what we're talking about is not having permission to be open and receptive to whoever you are, what your true essence is, because what we're saying is the overwhelming messages we're given are you need to fit into one of these boxes. Yeah, which is... It doesn't matter if if your authenticity is spread out between all of it. That's very difficult to exist in that state. There is not a lot of support and infrastructure to support that person, which is, it is worrying. What are you focused on now with your work? I'm starting my Enrealment Hour podcast, which I had hoped to do almost two years ago. And it, what's it called? The Enrealment Hour. Oh, wonderful. I'm working on a new quotes book. I'm writing a book about some political experiences that I had. I'm not sure if I'll publish it or if I'm just writing it for the purposes of my own closure and restoration, but I am very embroiled in that creative process. And I think that and the podcast and all the rest of my responsibilities will take up the next three or four months. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just want to thank you so much for the work that you do and for the insight and the wisdom that you share. I am very grateful for your work. And like I said, it resonates so much with me and your book, Articulation, is one of my new favorite discoveries. There's so much that you write about that I could spend hours talking to you about, but I really want people just to learn a little bit more about you and to go get this book themselves because there's endless um, insights and wisdom and points for discussion and self-reflection and conversation. So thank you. Thank you for taking the time to, to chat with me. Thank you, Amanda. I appreciate your bravery. I really do. Thank you. That's all we got for today. We did it. Wonderful. To be continued. Thank you for listening. 
please subscribe. And don't forget that if you love the conversation, then check out VS Voices, which highlights trailblazing women from around the world to celebrate the female experience. You can listen to Voices on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. And please don't forget to sign up for my weekly newsletter and follow me on social media at Amanda Decadene. 